Hello everyone, this is Vanguard of Valor, and welcome to Skyshine's Bedlam. So, surprise surprise, Bedlam was made by the developer Skyshine and was published by Versus Evil, and it's possibly the most appropriate game for this series that I've encountered so far, because Bedlam has a terrible new user experience, in my opinion. It's just does not do a very good job of explaining what you're meant to be doing or how to play the game properly to new players. The tutorials the game starts you off with are these five very straightforward 30 second video tutorials on what you should be doing as the very very baseline of the game and they don't really do a very good job of explaining how to play the game properly. They just tell you what the buttons do, basically. Uh, beyond that, there's not a whole lot that teaches you what you do, and you just gotta jump in the game and experiment. However, the jumping in and experimenting process is pretty darn frustrating as a new player. So, we're gonna get into the game here, see kind of what we're supposed to be doing to play the game a little bit more effectively, and we'll talk about some of the other issues and strengths it has. But before we do that, we're gonna take a quick peek at the options menu here because it's atrocious. Our options are full screen or widescreen, a language button you can't press, toggle music on and off, toggle sounds on and off, and quit the game. That's all you get. So if you're looking for any kind of options at all, you can't get them. You can change the windowed mode size. If you go to windowed, you can drag the edges of the screen around so you can get it in whatever resolution you want, but you have to measure that yourself because there's no settings at all. You just have to do it. With that out of the way, though, let's jump into a new run here and see what this game is all about. So it is a bit of a roguelike wasteland exploration adventure. We are uh, doing some tactical combat in the middle, but generally that's the theme. And the theme is one of the strongest parts of this game. The theme, the, the design, the music, the aesthetic, all pretty strong. At the beginning of the game, you need to pick your setup, like with most of these style of games. There are a bunch of different dozers for the different factions of the Wasteland. In this case, though, we are going to be going with humans, as that's the only unlocked dozer at the beginning of the game. And I've played the game for about eight hours now and still haven't unlocked anything else. So don't expect them to be quick to unlock. The unlocks are done by finding them in their territories, but I have no idea how that happens unless it's just random chance. And beyond that, we have ourselves some other information on the screen here. We have our resources. We have a thousand people on our on our dozer. This basically is just a game over timer. If you get down to zero, uh, you lose, and that's that seems like the only purpose these uh, passengers have. We also have the days. The days counter goes up as we travel and basically makes the game harder as we do, as well as healing our injured people slowly over time. We also have crude and meat, which are basically both kind of one resource, which determines how far you can travel again. Once these are out, you are stuck and you're in trouble. And we have power cells, which are the most important resource in this game, because they allow you to use special abilities, which are absolutely vital in the late game. And kind of all of the time, but it depends on how you use them. Beyond that, though, that's pretty much all we get. There's a little bit more information on the screen here, which is our activatable abilities. We have a dozer weapon, which is a basically a confusion area of effect attack, which has mm, varying degrees of effectiveness, as well as a two health heal on all of your people who are injured, and a half damage damage reduction ability that you can use in battle as well. Now, early in the game, these are insanely expensive. But once we get moving a little bit, they begin begin to become a little bit more reasonable. Either way, though, we're going to hop into the game here, and we can see a little bit about how this works in actual motion, because just looking at the details here doesn't really give us a lot of information. So we're going to hop into the game on normal. And we have our world map. So this is Bedlam here. This is the uh, mysterious wasteland in the middle of the world. We are starting in the town of Byzantine, which is a sort of techno city overrun by corruption and evil. So we're trying to find better lands in the mythical city of Aztec City. Now, in order to get there, we have to take these uh, somewhat confusingly designed paths throughout the cities, throughout the countries rather, the, the regions, and face off against what we find there in an effort to make it down to the end. Now, there's a ton of information on screen here. It's not too hard to understand, because a lot of the information is telling you how to understand the other information, but it's still a bit of a uh, cluttered UI, I find. We have some information here, like this location is a power reserve, so if we get there, then we'll get a bunch more uh, energy cells. This here is an equalizer, so it'll give us more of our weapons here, like the dozer weapons or battlefield equalizers, which are useful, but depending on what they are, they're varying effectiveness. And we have other information, like what kind of race is in each area. There's four different enemy types, the rogue AI, the cyborgs, the mutants, and the marauders, and they control different parts of the map. They generally have different abilities as well. 
the uh, the mutants, for example, power up from turn to turn. They start off with very low health, and they get stronger as they go. Uh, there's a there's a faction that can damage itself for a damage boost. The rogue AI can teleport. So there's a bunch of different abilities these guys have. And uh, let's get this show on the road here. The uh, the flavor of the game is definitely interesting. So we're going to start by heading out somewhere. You can get a taste of it yourself. Actually, before we do that, we should look at some of the other menus here because some of them are pretty important early in the game, like this one. This is our dozer upgrades. If our dozer is our base of operations and meant to be like, you know, something we build up over time, this is not the way to do it. Uh, this is all the dozer upgrades you have. There's four of them. One that upgrades your meat consumption rate, one that upgrades your crude consumption rate, one that upgrades your power cell consumption rate, and one that increases the speed at which your injured crew heal after battle. That's all there is. All of them are flat percentage-based increases or decreases, and they're not the most exciting. You can get these maxed out really quickly in the game if you actually put some effort into maxing them, and then you never need to worry about this again, which is, seems like a strange way to have your your craft upgrades work. In, in other roguelike games where upgrading your actual transportation is important, things, for example, like FTL, where you spend the entire game upgrading your ship to become much more powerful, this is really not relevant here. You just need to get these as quickly as possible and then never touch them again. So what we're going to do is we're going to put some points into engineering here, so we use less crude, which is one of our game over resources, and we'll throw another one as well into engineering, and we'll leave it at that for now, probably. We run in, we want to risk by spending these points right now, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, but let's just upgrade some things. So we're going to head over here to Slagbone, and we'll get into this later. This is actually a useless screen. This screen is your your crew screen, but that automatically launches every time you go into a battle anyway. So there's almost no reason to ever go there intentionally. So, here's a bit of the flavor of the game. As the dozer passes into the indigent fringe wards near the city's outer wall, the crowd thins and seems distinctly unrefined. A twitchy man, garbed in a frayed ignition jacket, steps into the road in the path of the dozer, standing with his arms outstretched. The man appears to be one of the rattle, radical metro zealots angered about Lazarus and his publicized journey to another fabled city beyond Bedlam. There is but one true city, the man screams. Those who defy the immaculate majesty of Byzantine shall be stricken in blood. With that, the man detonates his explosive clothing, but the impact barely scratches the dozer's exterior plating, instead leaving only a chunky red smear. At the city limits, the dozer approaches the colossal reinforced gates, which slowly rumble aside to allow passage for the daring expedition. So that's that. Um, there's only a couple of those starting events. You'll see them pretty often, uh, as it turns out. And now we have one course of action again. We can travel to this location, which is 100% of the time a battle. Your your second uh, travel location is always a fight. So let's go see what this is all about. It takes another four days, 104 crude, 84 meat. Shortly after leaving Byzantine, the dozer approaches large obstruction of scrap metal on the road. The crew disembarks to inspect the debris, only to be suddenly surrounded by a group of sinister cyborgs. That vehicle is the Snaz. We're gonna strip the gear and scrap the rest. But first, you pure fleshers gotta go. Alright, so I'm not gonna read all the text for these anymore. Um, just to give, give you a bit of the flavor of the world. So this is the combat screen. Now this is another mess of information. Uh, it, it's really cluttered as well, I find. But once you understand what you're looking at, it makes a lot more sense. So let's just clear out these people. So we can see what we're dealing with here. So, these are our four battle classes. Deadeyes, Frontliners, Gunslingers, and Trenchers. We have up to six slots for having a crew on our team. And they all have their different information associated with them. So, Deadeyes, at the top here. They're your snipers. They have pretty high damage, extremely low health. And they're very limited in their precision attacks. Most snipers you'd think can have a really far range, but can hit anything in, in between that range with penalties up close. These guys can only hit a target if it's exactly six tiles away. And they can only move three tiles in their turn. If an enemy gets close to them, there is literally nothing they will ever be able to do against that enemy. Somebody else has to come save them. So they're powerful, but they're very, very vulnerable. So we'll stick one of these guys down here on our away team. We have Frontliners. Frontliners are kind of like your melee tanks. They have a ton of health. As you can see, they got 10 health, more than anybody else by far. 
but they do a very, very small amount of damage, only being able to hit for two, which is really not very good. And since they're close range, they can only hit something that's directly next to them, which is also not wonderful. They do have great movement, being able to move six tiles in a turn, but they're a little bit questionable beyond that. Your gunslingers are kind of a mid-range unit. They have moderate health, moderate damage, and they have a three to four tile range. They still can't hit anything directly next to them, but they have a bit of a wider range than snipers, and they can move a little bit faster at four tiles, so they're kind of your mid-range fighters, and we'll take one of them with us. They're not bad. And we also have our trenchers here. Trenchers are your close range heavy hitters. They have reasonable health at six. They do four damage, which is much better than most of the other classes, plus they have one to two range, so they're a little bit more effective in that respect as well, as well as having five movement. So they're almost as strong as frontliners in health-wise, compared to other classes anyway. They do double the damage of frontliners, they have extra range, and they can move almost as far. So they're basically just better than frontliners, despite being a little bit more fragile. So they're just really good. Now, all of these characters have their own intricate backstories, but... I haven't really become attached to any of them, because they die extremely easily, and extremely often, generally, in the early game. So it's hard to really get attached to them, because you can't tell if they're going to last at all. Also, while you have six slots to bring crew, you see these two times multiplier items here? This basically means that if you take more than three crew, you are accepting taking half of the energy, half of the crewed, and half of the meat reward at the end of the mission which is really awful, especially this. You need energy cells really badly in this game, so accumulating these as much as possible is vital, which basically means you never want to take more than three crew. But, because of the way the battle system works, that's not much of a problem. So let's launch into the game here and see what I'm talking about. So, here we go. We're in the battle here. We have a random placement of ourselves, a random placement of the enemies. We have no control over these kinds of things, and we have to do our best to not die a brutal death as the game sets out. So, you'll notice here we have two green squares. That is the number of actions we can take before it's the enemy's turn. We get two actions in our turn, either two movements, two attacks, or a movement and an attack with any of our units, and then we're done. We can use any number of weapons or equalizers if we have the power for them, but we don't, so we can't. And that is how the game plays out. As you'll see here, our sniper, for example, has her three-tile movement range and her six-tile targeting range, and that is all they can hit. Our gunslinger here has a four-tile movement range and the associated three to four-tile shooting range, which is all they can hit. And our trencher has their range of five-tile movement and one to two-tile attacks. So we can kind of see what's going on in the battle here. We can also take a look at our enemies. We can see their movements and attacks as well. And that is what we get in combat. Beyond that, there's also resources on the map. For example, these energy cells or meat. If we pick those up, we get a bonus at the end. And there is uh, cover here. Cover in this game is very strange. Because of the way it acts, we can't shoot through cover. So you'll notice that if we stand here, there are no reticles on the left, on the, like the lower half of the screen here, nothing in this area, because cover blocks line of sight completely. So you can't put your snipers in cover and shoot over the cover, cover is just a block. Also, cover provides a flat mischance to anybody shooting at the target in cover. Which means that if we put our sniper here, no matter where somebody shoots at them from, that sniper has a chance to just dodge the attack. Even if it's way over here, if this sniper runs over somehow really far and snipes at them, we have a flat miss chance even though they're not blocked at all, which is kind of a weird system. Generally, cover is pretty irrelevant, but cover does have the chance to just completely destroy your strategy if you miss important shots and then you're going to lose people. We got a pretty lucky setup here because we can immediately kill off this enemy, and we will absolutely do that, and they've just wandered around not using their turn effectively at all, which is great for us. So that was a pretty good first battle. One of the big problems you can run into in this game is that if you don't get good first turns, things can go horribly, horribly wrong for you. Especially because the game is still set up in a way which allows enemies to effectively ambush you. So you get into a fight, you're surrounded by a bunch of enemies who can attack you all on their first turn, and unless you can get everybody out of the way, which you often can't, you're just going to lose someone. Thankfully, there looks like they're updating the game to remove that soon, which is good because it's a very, very unfortunate system. But as of now, it's still in the game, so we still have to deal with it. What we're going to do here is we need to get rid of this frontliner now with the wary of this sniper. 
They can move pretty far and we'll be able to do a ton of damage to anybody they can shoot. We want to try to avoid losing anybody if we can help it. So we're going to try and do something a little bit sneaky here. We're going to take our trencher, move him around next to this guy. Get in the cover ourselves so we're protected against their counterattacks. It seems as though melee hits don't actually give you that effect. So if a trencher, for example, or rather a frontliner here hits our trencher here, he has no chance of missing with his melee attack, but I can't confirm that yet. But we're going to blast him away with our shotgun. Shotguns have the special quality of knocking back your target. So now he can't double attack us on his turn because he's been knocked away. There we go. This sniper just committed suicide for some reason by running into our targeting line. And as you can see here, this guy now has less health than he started with because he's drained his health into his weapon damage. So we're going to kill him here and get rid of him. There is literally no reason not to do that since he just spent both of his turns walking into our attacks perfectly into our line of attack, no reason to ever not take advantage of that. And we're also going to bring our gunslinger over here to protect our sniper in case this guy decides to run for it. Thankfully he didn't though, so we can deal with him anyway. So we can shoot him here with a shotgun attack and that will push him back again, so he still won't be able to kill our hero here, and we're doing just fine. We can't follow up with a kill here, but we have no reason to be suspect anything else will go wrong, because he can't get anywhere dangerous. The only person he can attack is Geiger, and Geiger cannot die to this attack, so we don't even have to do something, but we have to move a little bit, otherwise the game won't let us progress. There's no take no action button, as far as I can tell. So, we're just going to back up one tile. He comes back and attacks us predictably. Never mind, he did three damage because he powered himself up, so we're dead now. And we need to kill him. So look, that's that was a misjudgment on my part, but I'm not too worried. The odds of him being able to actually stop us now are basically still zilch. He'll run over at us, and now we take some damage, we can back and kill him. We don't even need to though, because gunslingers have the automatic ability to counterattack. So, it's unfortunate we lost our trencher there, but I forgot these guys power themselves up over time. But even then, there wasn't a whole lot else we could have done. We didn't have any of our abilities. If we had had the ability... If we had saved some of our power cells, we could have done a two health heal to protect him. But we didn't. And we ha still have gained some resources. So, that's how it goes. That's how battle generally goes. You only ever get two turns at a time, which makes doing any complicated strategies really, really inefficient because you just don't have the um, the mobility and the versatility to be able to do that. None of your characters have special abilities beyond what's natively part of their passive abilities. Snipers can do high damage headshots sometimes, like we saw. The gunslingers can counterattack. The um, shotguns have knockback, and that's basically it. Um, even if you gain characters of other races as part of your party, they don't gain that race's special ability. If you get a rogue AI, they can't teleport. If you get a, you know, marauder, they can't damage themselves to do more damage to you or to enemies. They, they just don't get those abilities. So the combat is really straightforward in, mo in most respects. But, uh, yeah, that was just a, an error on my part because I'm trying to do this video at the same time. I probably could have lived through that no problem if I had been a bit more careful. So, we got a bunch more power cells, which is important. We're going to want to use those if we can. Probably want to spend some of them pretty quick here. But more importantly, we have a bit more options available to us. We have two locations we can go to. This one is a border that will take us into the cathode chasm. We can spend our, our time to come over this way to come closer to Dunder or Charnel Pass. Charnel Cross, rather. Charnel Cross. But first, we want to visit some points of interest. There's three to four points of interest every time you take a new uh, location, and they're almost always worth going to, even though the events themselves aren't particularly interactive. So we'll head over this way and see what's up. As the clue explores the area, they discover an expansive field that was once contained by a high metal fence long since fallen to ruin. A faded sign lying in the dust lays slain in max door solutions. In the center of the field is a large structure that resembles some kind of warehouse. So we have two options here, do the event or don't do the event. Checking the perimeter of the warehouse, the crew finds a heavy security door. Fortunately, exposure to the elements over long ages has weakened the alloy, and the crew is able to use their fusion torches to cut through the locks. Weapons ready, the crew cautiously enters the warehouse and makes an unsettling discovery. Inside the warehouse are rows and rows of metallic shafts with shriveled humanoid forms hanging from them. These appear to be used in the ancient conglomerate conflicts farmed in this kind of vast facility. The desiccated husks would indicate that their process was interrupted, leaving the ghoulish petrified remains sealed and forgotten over the ages. And again, we have two options. Do the event, don't do the event. The crew explores the macabre warehouse. Their sunken eyes are the suspended clone husks seeming to watch their every motion. They are unable to locate any items of value in the facility. 
The crew leaves the unpleasant sight behind and returns to the dozer. And we got nothing. And that's kind of how most of the events in this game go. Either you go into a location, you push the do the event button until you either get a reward or don't get a reward, or it winds up being a combat or a trade operation. There's, there's basically no interactivity with the events beyond whether or not you choose to do the event, which is kind of disappointing. It's not like you have a variety of options and what you choose modifies what can happen. It's basically just you either do the event or don't, which is kind of disappointing. There are some ways in which these events interact with each other, though. So let's hop into another one and see if we can get something else more interesting. All right, we're drawn by the sound of conversation this time. There's a, a lone wanderer engaged in discussion with himself. So... We find a crazy person here, and we can either talk to him, attack him, or leave. Like I said, I'm not going to read all of these. just want to give you a little bit of flavor. Now, if you talk to him, he gives you a random item, which you may or may not be able to use to open another area later in the game. I have found, I think, up to seven items in one campaign without ever finding any of the doors they open, although I did find some of the things that I could open with items I didn't get. So, they're inconsistent whether or not you can use them, but we'll talk to him and get an item anyway. So, what does he give us? He hands us a makeshift device, and we'll take it. It's a Neutronic Tuning Fork. Whether that'll be useful or not, we will never know. But it's always worth checking out all of these beacons, getting everything you can, because on the off chance that they prove useful, you might as well take advantage of them. We find a massive spherical structure here. Let's see what it does. We have the option to try and shoot the vines, which are trying to slither off and attack us. Alright, well, we have the option to do it or not do it. We shoot them, nothing happens, and we leave. And we have one more option here. All of these are consuming days and fuel and crude. Rather, food and crude. But, uh, regardless, we want to take every opportunity we can to find something useful. While the crew explores the area, we find a lone cyborg straining through the scrap and rubble. Well, let's talk to him. So, we've discovered a cyborg here who we can invite to join the crew, or we can just try and murder him. Attacking the cyborg doesn't actually always even start a combat. Sometimes you just instantly kill whatever you're attacking and go on your merry way, or they teleport away, or whatever. So, not exactly what you would expect. It doesn't start combat most of the time. For now, though, we'll invite him to join our dozer, because why not? And uh, he says that he can't leave without being able to find an item that we don't have. So, we don't really want to fight him right now. He might come back and attack us later. If we do, we'll just leave. And that's it. That was the four events of this beacon. We had three events where nothing happened because we either didn't find anything or there was nothing to be there. There was one where we didn't have a proper item to potentially help out. And one where we got a random item which may or may not be useful to us. You can't do anything with it. It just is an item key, so you can use it in different events. There are some more interesting events, like there are some where if you have certain crew on your dozer, you can use them to gain a guaranteed success, which is kind of cool, but in general, the events are pretty straightforward. So, we're gonna head on down southwards for another beacon here, and we'll see what else we find along the way. Here we find the areas populated long ago, and there was a bunch of cities and things. There are wounded people who will stop and investigate. And they seem relieved to see us. They thank us for stopping and say they've been getting attacked, but they do have power cells. So either we can take them on our rig, which gives us uh, less chance of dying and gives us more power cells, or we can say, no, you can't. So, we'll take them. Done. We get 21 power cells and 75 passengers, and that's a flat benefit we get there. So, we can use those power cells to upgrade ourselves again. We can put them into our, these various resources. So let's power up our food and our crude cell, because those are the game over conditions. And then we will be in better shape again. We're going to put a couple of armory here, because these are very cheap. And those reduce the cost of using abilities in battle, which is generally a really good thing. And we're at our time for our next... Uh, next voyage. So what we're going to do here is we're going to check out these three points of interest, see if we get anything interesting, and then we're going to go to this location, which is an elite battle, which is kind of like our first boss fight. So we'll do that, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about a couple other little things, and then we will be done. So we'll hop into another location here and see what it has for us. Anything of interest, just to give you a, a taste of what kind of things we have here. We have another uh, do the event or don't do the event. We find a shelter. We go in. There is a dead cyborg. Things have gone horribly wrong. And we find some batteries. We had no interaction with it, it just gives us 14 power cells. I mean, I'll take them, 14 power cells are good, pow good power cells, but we had no interaction with that event, really. It's all flavor. 
And after this time, we got a battle. We find ourselves facing a rather irritable looking cyborgs who immediately fire on us. And that is a battle trigger, so it's time to start fighting. We have to alternate our crew. It is, of course, permadeath. Once our people are dead, they do not come back. So we need to put together a new team here. Grab another trencher, grab another gunslinger. I basically never use frontliners, and we can start another combat. Alright, so here's the situation. We are pretty badly surrounded. This person is going to immediately die because they spawned in our sniper sight, and that just happens sometimes. And we have another interesting thing here. Good. Now we have a promoted soldier. Once your soldiers get three kills, they immediately promote to higher ranked soldiers. In this case, for snipers, it gives them a larger range so they no longer can only hit six tiles away. And it also means that they do more damage and have more health. However, unfortunately, snipers, even, at even leveled up like this, are still extremely vulnerable. Because five health still means they die to a single untrained sniper shot. So, you have to be very careful with this kind of thing, because even when it looks like you might be safe, you're still probably not safe. We have another sniper here who we're directly in his line of sight, so if we don't move here, then we're going to lose our trencher, or at least take a lot of damage on our trencher and risk taking more. And we have another gunslinger over here who thankfully can only hit our sniper. So if he chooses to run over here to the sniper, we won't die, but it will suck. What we're going to do to protect that is we're going to send our trencher over here to give us a lesser chance of being ambushed, and we'll see how it works out. Yeah, he does exactly what we thought we would. He moves over this way and attacks us. However, he doesn't actually choose to attack our sniper. Now this guy's in cover. Which means we may just be seriously unlucky here and be unable to actually do this properly, which would be really bad. But we're going to do our best to kill this guy in a single attack. We're going to back up our sniper so he actually has a chance to hit this guy. Puts our sniper in cover, which is safer for us. And we'll see if we can hit the target. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. And we got lucky. There was no missed chance that time that significantly stopped us. This uh, sniper is trying to get close enough to give us a hard time, but thankfully for us, we can charge right over next to him and instantly kill him with our trencher. Problem solved. Some of the battles go this way. You could just easily clear the battlefield and there's no problem. The other thing is that the two, the two action limit means that there's really no problem having a smaller team, because you wouldn't be able to use a bigger team anyway. Having more people in the battlefield just gives you more people you have to try and protect against death, especially at the start of battle, which makes things really unfortunate. As well, because the enemies only get two turns, having a bigger force for them doesn't make any difference. And as the game gets harder, harder just means that they have more and more and more and more of the basic enemies. The basic enemies never get stronger, you just get a whole lot more of them. So the combat balance is a little bit wonky, but either way, we got a nice big reward here for killing these guys. So that was a decent beacon. We managed to get ourselves a bunch of stuff, so it worked out okay. We should definitely spend this stuff, though, because otherwise we're going to run into problems later. So we'll pump this into maxing out our armory, which is already at the highest tier it could possibly be, and maxing out our crude costs. There we go. It's It's got one upgrade left in it, but these are almost done, and we've hardly spent any time in combat at all. Check out one more of these beacons, and we'll check out the Elite. Alright, we have another do something or don't do something. There's an inhuman shriek from the plateau above. We explored the plateau, and we find that a cyborg is twitching in the death of something else. Nothing survived. And we find that there's meat. There we go. 26 meat, which is almost nothing. Perfect. So that's the whole first section completed, and all we got was some some flavorful events, to be sure, but no interaction at all, no, no way to modify anything in them, really, beyond choosing to attack things or not attack things. And, uh... And that's about it. Let's hop over here and fight our elite battle, because these are actually interesting. These are, are fairly important as well. King Viserys and Briv Trumbull to splat your soft little fleshes with my roto cannon. It's gonna be messy. Alright, so we have an enemy here who has a um basically a minigun, and we have to try and kill him before things go horribly wrong. Now we can actually take our, our, our shotgunner here into battle again if we want. They just start with less health because they haven't had a chance to heal, but we will switch them out for a different one. Not that it's going to make a huge difference, because there's a good chance that this elite will just instantly kill anybody they attack. So let's hop into a battle here and see if we can get through this alive or if we are in trouble. Alright, so he's the only person on the battlefield. He's the only target. Biv here has 11 health, does 7 damage on any attack, so any of the, the three people we brought with us will instantly die if he attacks them. He has a huge movement range and a huge aim range. 
He also takes up a 2x2 two two tile space, which can make attacking them with different kind of character classes really difficult. This is just how the game uh, implements these guys. They're always 2x2, two two. they always have massive health and firepower compared to regular units, and they're always very effective. Now, in this case, however, these enemies are more interesting than your normal foes. If we can kill them, we can actually hire them. They immediately join our team, and they only take up one unit slot. So by the end of the game, you basically want to be using three elites and none of your normal units, because these guys are just straight up better than anything else you'll ever get, which is kind of an unfortunate setup. As it stands, though, we got to manipulate this guy into not being able to kill us. So if he moves forward four tiles, he can still shoot four tiles, which means he'd be able to shoot one, two, three, four. You can barely see the grid on the ground. That's apparently something they're changing in a recent, in a soon update, hopefully. So he won't be able to kill us even if he takes both turns moving towards us. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to back up a little bit with my sniper in the hopes of still being able to hit him if he does come towards us. And we're going to move our Gunslinger back a little bit as well, and we'll see what he does. He should run straight at us, because that's all he can do. And he has, which means he's dead now, because he walked into our Sniper, who can shoot him twice. He has no dodge chance, so this battle is over. Done. Sometimes those battles go really well, sometimes they do not, depending on what the enemy is doing, depending on the layout, depending on whether or not they get allies. That was an extremely easy one. And now we have jo got him joining us, which means we'll be bringing him on every single mission we can, because he is incredibly powerful compared to any other gunslinger. His range is the same, but he does 7 damage compared to their starting 3, he has more than double their health, he's just better than any other gunslinger we will ever find, unless it's potentially another elite gunslinger. So, that's a thing. It makes getting elites the basically the goal of our travels, as well as accumulating power cells, because we'll need those later. And it makes our regular soldiers pretty irrelevant once we start to find replacements that are those elites. So, that is the gist of the game here. That is what we'll be doing the entire travel down to Aztec City. Now, that's not necessarily awful. It becomes a little bit more challenging once they start throwing more enemies at you, but then you can start relying more heavily on your dozer weapons, because we've reduced the cost of this from 40 to 25, which makes it more usable. You often make more than that back in later missions, as long as you only use one. You can find more powerful weapons as well, like an actual just nuke that blows up a large section of the map and kills anything there. And there's a variety of other abilities you can find that make things a little bit more interesting and versatile, but really, the point of this game is to acquire elites, veter level them up so they're even more powerful, and then acquire a ton of power cells to use your super weapons whenever you are starting to get overwhelmed. Now, one thing I am going to want to talk about here is the end game. So if you're not interested in hearing that, thank you very much for watching. This has been Welcome to Skyshine's Bedlam. Uh, hopefully you've learned what you want to learn about the game. But for those of you who are interested in this, this is, this is another thing. In this game, the beginning of the game is the hardest part because it's so difficult to get started sometimes if you're getting ambushed all the time and the very end. This game has a crazy multi-stage boss battle at the end. The last boss attacks you four times in a row with a slight delay in between each attack and every time he comes back stronger and stronger and stronger with increasingly ridiculous abilities and firepower as well as a swarm of enemies. Now unless you have like 400 power cells you're gonna be really hard-pressed to survive that attack because it has insane firepower. There's, I think the final boss stages generally insta-kill, do more than 10 damage on most attacks. So they'll insta-kill any regular enemies you have. It might take two turns to kill your elites. So it gets pretty insanely powerful later in the game, and the only way to survive is by spamming your uh, dozer abilities. So unless you have enough power cells by the time you get there, you are going to lose 100% of the time, which is kind of a disappointing thing. There's no way strategy can help you because you just need to be able to hold out. One of the last boss stages has like 80 health, so unless you have a ton of survivability through those abilities, you're just not going to be able to beat him, which is, I feel, a pretty major oversight, uh, which is kind of disappointing. Also, it's, uh, it's also worth mentioning that the, uh, the end game is kind of it feels very counterintuitive, very, very counterproductive. You make your way from all the way from Byzantine down to Aztec City, and then you have to make your way all the way back, except there's none of the 
uh, investigation events. It's all just clicking these buttons, the major events, until you get back there or until you face the various stages of the boss fight, which is kind of disappointing. So the end game is a little bit questionable right now, and and that's kind of my my biggest thing about the whole game. There's just a lot of design decisions in this game that are kind of unusual, that that either either don't make a whole lot of sense to to me at least, or are very unintuitive to a new player. Especially if you, for example, burned all of your fuel trying to get to Aztec City, you know, just trying to barely make it there, and then the game's like, okay, now turn around, go all the way back, and fight a boss four times. It's it's not a it's not a fun feeling to suddenly realize that you're just doomed. There's no way you can survive that return trip. So that's kind of an unfortunate thing. But if this looks interesting to you, then by all means you can check it out. It's available on Steam for I believe twenty dollars US. I think it's twenty one ninety nine Canadian or whatever your equivalent is. There's a link in the description below. It's definitely not a terrible game. It's not it's not bad per se. It's just really unintuitive in a lot of ways. The design has some weird flaws about it, and it really does not is not kind to new players. So hopefully, if this is your kind of thing, you'll be able to enjoy it. But if you're looking for an experience you can just dive into and start enjoying right away, this may not be the thing for you, or at least not yet. They're working on improving the game with a bunch of updates at the moment. They're talking about reducing the number of ambush murders that happen to you. So that should hopefully help. But as it stands, it's kind of hard to recommend Bedlam unless you are really into this kind of uh, genre where if things don't go well for you in the early game, you're just not going to be able to win. You just may as well restart and try again. As it stands, though, we're going to leave this video here for now. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. This has been Vanguard of Valor, and welcome to Skyshine's Bedlam. Until next time, bye bye